I'm Phyllis Diller. Welcome back to the Lost Episodes. Our next program is Judge for Yourself, hosted by comedian Fred Allen. It hasn't been broadcast anywhere in over 40 years. This show is so old, when it was originally aired, I was still on my first face. <laughs> One of the guests is the great Arthur Fiedler, the longtime conductor of the Boston Pops Orchestra. Now, let's watch Judge for Yourself from December 29th, 1953. <laughs> It's the Fred Allen Show, Judge for Yourself. Get on with the show, and here is the star of Judge for Yourself, Mr. Fred Allen himself. Here he is. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Judge for Yourself. Well, of course, this is the week that all of the newspapers select the man of the year. And also, they list the minor celebrities for 1953. Uh, a lot of many people who have accomplished practically nothing during the year, and whose names uh, you have possibly forgotten long before this. For example, who knows the name of the little girl who was voted Miss Rheingold for 1953? Or the first housewife who wrote an indignant letter to Arthur Godfrey after Arthur had liquidated Julius LaRosa. <laughs> or the most unusual man to appear on Strike It Rich this past year. He was certainly unusual because he had nothing wrong with him and he didn't want anything. <laughs> but uh, looking through the, uh, looking through the uh, paper yesterday, I did uh, run across one uh, exceptional statistic on the uh, uh, real estate page of the New York Times. And it said that in 1953, more people had moved out of New York City to live in the suburbs than in any other year. Now, I think that people who move out to the suburbs and start uh, commuting on the subway are wasting their time. Because you can look at any man in the subway, and I defy you to tell me where he comes from. And I'll tell you why. Now, suppose a man lives out in Jackson Heights. He goes down into the subway, his lungs are filled with good, clean, invigorating Long Island uh, air. He rides downtown. At Canal Street, a man gets on. His lungs are filled with Bowery Flophouse fume. <laughs> now, the two men are jammed together. They start breathing in each other's faces, you see. Well, eventually, when they get to where they're going, the man from Canal Street finds that his lungs are filled with the Long Island air, and the other man's uh, lungs are filled with the Bowery fumes, you see. So that is why, ladies and gentlemen, thanks to the subway, people who live on Canal Street look better than people who live in Jackson Island. <laughs> and uh, that's my moral for the end of the year. And this is... <laughs> This, I tell you, this isn't much of a joke if you have no subway in your town. Uh, if you haven't, just put this joke in the deep freeze, and when a subway comes along, you take it out, and you'll see it'll work out pretty well. But this is our farewell uh, Judge for Yourself show of 1933, ladies and gentlemen, and here is how our show works. These three studio judges were selected from the mail and invited here tonight to test their skill at judging talent. D.E. Henderson, a lawyer. Carol Weathersby, a bank teller. Henry C. Roberts, a book dealer. They can win $1,000 if they rate tonight's acts in the same order as this distinguished jury of show business experts. The man who is director of entertainment for the Sheraton Hotel chain, Mr. Al Banks. The general manager of the music department of Cashbox. The publication of the music and record industry, Mr. Bob Austin. The world famous conductor of the Boston Pops Orchestra, Maestro Arthur Fiedler. And that's our board of experts. Well, I, uh, I certainly want to enjoy, uh, I want to uh, welcome our board of experts tonight, and I hope that they have a pleasant visit with us, ladies and gentlemen. And now to get the start, uh, show started, the start showed, or either one, it works out either way. But uh, our first contestant to start the show is uh, Mr. D. E. Henderson, Judge Henderson. Mr. Henderson, uh, you comfortable there, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, we want you to have a carton of old golds to start your smoking New Year off on the uh, right lip, uh, as we say in the smoking circle. Now, Carolina. pardon? From North Carolina. From North Carolina. Well, you certainly know more about cigarettes than I do. But I hope. You, like, you don't uh, have the tobacco chant at hand by any chance, do you? Oh. 
Well, Judge, in your letter here, you say that you are uh, now a lawyer in private practice and you were formerly a federal judge. Is that right? That's right. I was appointed federal judge in 1948 uh -huh. by... Mr. Truman, who was then president. Oh, I see. Well, I, of course, I know how Harry lost his job. How did you lose your job? I served out uh, my recess appointment. Oh, you did? Well, do people still call you judge down there? Well, they might as well. It's easy on them because my name is rather long. Oh, is it? Well, what, uh, what is your full name? My full name is Jackson Ezekiel David James. Mm -hmm. Nathaniel Sylvester Willis Edward Demothenes Henderson. Well, that sure is a king-size name, all right, Judge. Your christening must have brought on a water shortage down there. At home. <laughs> Tell me, how come, how come you have so many fa uh, first names, uh, Judge? My father named me for all of my rich uncles, hoping that someday I would inherit some money. <laughs> well, how did it work out? I never got a cent. <laughs> you never got a cent. That's an awful let. You still have to carry the names around. You never got a court. Well, what kind of, a, what kind of law do you specialize in, Judge? The general practice, uh, we do a great deal of work in divorce cases. Uh -huh. However, I try to uh, patch up their differences and... Keep it out of the courts if I can. Well, that's certainly good for you. Do you have Do you have any success? Sometimes, for instance, not long ago, a couple came into the office and wanted to see about a divorce. Uh huh. And so I, I undertook to find out what the trouble was. Well, what was the trouble? The woman said that she'd been married for twenty years, and for fifteen years of that time, said she'd worked hard and she'd done everything in the world she could think of to make her husband happy. But during all of that time, he had not thanked her for a thing that she had done, and he had not told her that he loved her a single time. Uh -huh. The man said, Now, honey, she says, I want to tell you once for all, I do love you. Uh, I come on and let's go home. They went home. Uh -huh. And another home was saved. Well, that's certainly a nice story, Judge, and, and uh, I, I thought you had a big finish on the end there, but I, uh, it was a happy ending. I was expecting a big... <laughs> well, it's certainly been nice. You certainly twisted a thing on me, and uh, uh, now the time has come for you to test your skill at judging talent. Of course, you're a judge. This won't be any tr uh, trouble for you. And here's a lyric soprano who has been, uh, has been a soloist with the Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera Company and recently appeared at Radio City uh, Music Hall, Miss Marjorie Gordon. <laughs>
our next studio judge to test our talent tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Carol Withersby. Miss Withersby, with our compliments, we want you to have a carton of the king-size old gold for your smoking pleasure. Now, Carol, in your letter here, you don't mind if I call you Carol, do you? Oh, not at all. It's so near the Christmas season, you know, Carol. To... But uh, in your letter here, in your, your, your letter, you say that you work as a teller in the bank. Is that right? That's right. Well, you're, you're very uh, pretty, Carol. Have you, uh, you don't mind me saying that either, do you? Oh, no. Uh, have you ever thought about opening your own bank? Well, I've thought of it, but I just don't have the money to start it with. Well, you certainly draw a lot more interest than money would, I'm sure. <laughs> well, tell me, what kind of a bank do you work in? Well, it's small and cozy and very friendly. A friendly bank, really? Oh, yeah. Uh, how friendly is it? Does the bank permit the boys and girls to dance in the vault at lunchtime? Do they... <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. Actually, there are only three women employed in our branch. Oh, really? Three in the bank? What, what happens if anything, uh, if there's a holdup? Just three women squealing with no uh, burglar alarm or anything? Well, it sounds rather lonely with just three girls there. It must be an event when the armored car arrives every afternoon. Well, uh, we are too small to have an armored car bring any money to us. Oh, just a boy with a tin vest comes up uh, during the afternoon. <laughs> well, what attractions does your bank offer to the depositor? Well, we give out combs to the women, and we have lollipops for the children. <laughs> <laughs> and we have music playing, and we also su supply scorecards for bridge parties. Oh, you do, really? Well, never mind the lollipops and the music playing. How much interest do you pay up there? Well, frankly, not too much. We only pay... One half of one percent. We're not a savings bank. Oh, you're not. Well, of course, the, the, the interest isn't much. The principal is the thing. If you can never get the principal out, that's the main thing. Well, it's been nice talking to you. I've learned a little about banking. If I ever have any money, it'll come in uh, very handy, Carol. And now it's time for you to try your skill at, at judging. And here's a fine accordion player. He has appeared in theaters and clubs throughout the country. He's playing that Samore. And here he is. I want you to meet Bill Costa. Bill Costa, ladies and gentlemen. I'm always interested in the accordion. It's, it's a, a fact that very few people know that the uh, uh, inventor of the accordion, after he had uh, surveyed his work and played on it a little while, uh, later invented the piano so that he could sit down and play. It's an interesting thought I just throw in uh, as I'm waiting for... Well, thank you, Dennis. And here's our next studio judge to judge our talent tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Henry C. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, with our compliments, we want you to have a carton of old golds for your smoking pleasure. Now, in your letter, Mr. Roberts, you say that you sell rare books and that you are also a leading authority on Nostradamus. 
Now, Nostradamus, uh, Nostradamus is, is that right? Nostradamus? Nostradamus or Nostradamus? Uh, I have a choice, do I, with a dollar dinner? You, you, you have well, he was, uh, he was the, uh, the famous French astrologer who made the prophecies about five, uh, four or five hundred years ago, wasn't he? Yes, he, he, he wrote the complete prophecies of Nostradamus. Uh-huh. Well, uh, Nostradamus was the, uh, in other words, he was the 16th century Drew Pearson with his predictions of things to come. Yes, he, he predicted the, uh, the atom age, the atom war, and the eventual peace on Earth. 400 years 400 ago. 400 years ago, yeah. Well, do you believe in the prophecies of Nost uh, Nostradamus? Well, I wrote the uh, complete prophecies of Nostradamus, and I believe that I am the living reincarnation of him. You are the reincarnated Nostrad Nostradamus? Nostradamus yeah. You were formerly Nostradamus, and you returned as Henry C. Roberts. Yeah, positive. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is, uh, well, Henry, with things the way they are in the world, you sure picked a lousy time to come back. <laughs> it's, it's not my option. <laughs> Thank you. picked yeah, another yeah. era. Yeah. Well, as the reincarnation of Nostradamus, now tell me, do you feel that you have any special powers? Well, I feel... You don't look like a powerful man, frankly, but do you have these powers? Well, I feel that I have developed special powers really? that I can project myself forwards or backwards into time and space, and I can will myself to be anywhere and I will be there. You mean you stay, you can stay in one place, but your mind goes places? Spiritually. Well, as you are sitting here now, has your mind gone? <laughs> I mean, you and I are still here together now, aren't we? Well, tell me, uh, uh, shall I call you Mr. Roberts or Nostradamus? Which Nostradamus would be Nostradamus. better. Nostradamus. Well, Nos, uh, with your... Uh, with your <laughs> Look, tell me, with your wonderful powers, are you ever bothered by any... Uh, mysterious signs or anything that you personally cannot understand. Well, uh, I have a, uh, a statue of the Dalai Lama, uh, which has always puzzled me. Uh huh. And uh, a short while ago, a yogi dropped into my place. Where do you live? Uh, at Canal Street. <laughs> Canal Street, and the yogi happened to drop in. Yogi <laughs> dropped in, and uh, I called to his attention, and yeah. uh, uh, he said that he would try to. Uh, uh, find out uh, the, uh, where it came from and give me the information on it. Well, what did he tell you about the statue that bothered you? Well, uh, he found out that uh, this statue, that uh, it vibrated. It vibrated, it vibrated really? Yes, it vibrated. He didn't have the shakes as he was holding it. No, it vibrated, <laughs> and uh, he, in, in the, uh, he would communicate uh, with the lamas of Tibet. Oh. And uh, bring out of it the hidden message that was embodied in this particular uh, statue. Without the help of Western Union, you got this through <laughs> Tibet. Well, what did it say? What was the message? Well, the message that the that the uh, this statue said it the uh, he made a sound uh, like a vibrating sound, a sibilant sound. Uh huh. And uh, as he did that, he held my hand. Yeah. And uh, well, what was the message? I know uh, the message. Uh, uh, it was hollow, and out came the. Uh, uh, the Tibetan words was a message 400 years old in there, a manuscript that was hollow, yeah. and it said that, uh, in part, that Eisner Huri, uh -huh. that is Eisenhower in English, uh, would be the next president of the United States in 1952. That was 400 years 400 ago. 400 years ago, that was said, And yes. uh, the Republicans sure have been waiting a long time. <laughs> been nice looking into the future with you, Nostradamus, <laughs> and uh, you didn't look fast because we were cut off here, and yeah. I, we could have saved a couple yeah. of minutes. Yeah. But uh, the time has come for you to test your skill at judging talent. It's just a gesture as yeah. far as you're concerned, because I know you realize who's going to win right away. <laughs> well, we, we're going to show you our next act, and you can judge for yourself. Here's a young man who is a veteran of motion pictures, theaters, radio, and television. I know you've seen him and heard him before. I want you to meet Bobby Breen.
like the oncoming tide with one burning thought with your arms open wide at last we're face to face and as we keep If any of our studio judges can rate the acts in exactly the same order as the experts, he will win $1,000. If there is more than one winner, the studio judges will share the prize. We will be back for the ratings after... Well, thank you, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us see how our studio judges have rated our acts tonight. First, Judge Henderson, I see you have arrived at your verdict there. Tell me, how have you rated our acts one, two, and three? Bobby Breen, one. Uh-huh. Marjorie Gordon, two. Uh-huh. Bill Costa, three. Uh-huh. Bobby, Bobby Breen, first. Marjorie Gordon, second. And Bill Costa, third. Thank you very much, Judge. And now, Miss Weathersby, how have you rated our acts? First, I have Marjorie Gordon, uh -huh. second, Bobby Green, uh -huh. and third, Bill Costa. Marjorie Gordon, Bobby Breen, and Bill Costa. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Nostradamus, tell us how have you rated our acts? Bobby Breen, one. Uh-huh. Uh, Marjorie Gordon, two. Uh-huh. Bill Costa, three. Bobby Breen, Marjorie Gordon, and Bill Costa. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us see if any of our studio uh, judges have met the, uh, matched the findings of our experts. And Mr. Fiedler, speaking for your group, tell us which act have you selected for first place? Well, because of her excellent vocal technique, we've chosen Marjorie Gordon as first place. First place, Marjorie Gordon. Thank you. And second place? Bobby Breen. Bobby Breen, second place. And third, of course, Bill Costa. Bill Costa. Thank you very much. The results on our scoreboard show that the studio judge who matched the experts is Carol Weathersby, who wins $1,000. Well, congratulations, Miss Weathersby. The makers of Old Gold Cigarettes are certainly happy to give you our first prize of $1,000, uh, 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 winning prize for tonight. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're sorry that uh, Judge and Nostradamus, you didn't pick out things. You looked out beyond tonight. I think you were looking into the future. Uh, but we have a consolation prize for you. Old Gold wants you to have $50 each for your consolation prize. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our time is gone. Next week, to start the, the, the new year off well, we're going to add some things that we know you will like to our show, some new features of our show uh, you'll enjoy. Now, so be sure to tune in next Tuesday night for Judge for Yourself. In the meantime, a happy, happy new year from all of us here in the studio. Thank you very much. We'll see you next Tuesday with a few surprises that I know you're going to enjoy. Thank you very much, and good night. We have all this time left over.